Dinosaurs are a group that, suffice to say, have captured the imagination of the entire world. But our views on them have radically changed over the course of 180 years. From giant iguanas to towering, cold-blooded kangaroo lizards that grew redundant, to fluffy, intelligent bird relatives whose time was cut short. There's quite a few dinosaurs responsible for contributing to this change of view, but none of them have contributed quite as much as Deinonychus. Now, I normally like to take a look at the discovery of the animal first in my paleo profiles, but I'm actually going to take a look at the description of the animal itself first. For those who don't know, Deinonychus is a dromaeosaur, a group of dinosaurs that are more often referred to by their colloquial term, raptors. For this group, it was also pretty typical. For a dinosaur, it was a relatively small and lightly built theropod with surprisingly long digits on their clawed forelimbs and the iconic sickle-shaped toe claw on each foot. The tail was extremely stiff and long as well, not only acting as a counterbalance, but also the stiffness helped to strengthen the tendons that pulled the legs back for bursts of speed and for tight controlled steering in case any quick turns were required. Going back to the front, we see that Deinonychus also had a very typical dromaeosaur head, with powerful jaws lined with serrated curved blade teeth, as well as a long snout, narrow from top view, and notably large antorbital fenestrae and eye sockets. The nasal bones were not quite as concave as Velociraptor though, and the jugals flared outwards, giving this dinosaur some pretty good binocular vision. Basically, Deinonychus as a skeleton looked more or less like the raptors from Jurassic Park. Which makes sense, since you're looking at the animal that these movie monsters were based on. More so than the actual Velociraptor. There were still some differences though. For a start, Deinonychus was a smidge smaller than the raptors we saw in the movies, at around 3 to 3.4 metres, or 10 to 11 feet long, and around 3 feet tall at the hip, weighing anywhere between 60 to 100 kilograms, or 132 to 220 pounds. Now it's when you start to put flesh in this skeleton that you really start to see the main differences to these movie monsters. Unlike the scaly bipedal monitor lizards with broken wrists that many are used to, Deinonychus, like all dromaeosaurs, was covered head to tail to legs in feathers. These feathers would have been short and filamentous on the head, likely covering it in such a way that gave it a beaked appearance when the mouth was closed and the rest of the body was covered in longer, down-like feathers and prettier, pinaceous feathers along the tail and forelimbs, giving it a tail fan and what heavily resembled bird wings. Essentially, this dinosaur would have looked more like a giant, flightless bird of prey, of which another word for is raptor. Now, it's like they did it on purpose. Now, before we get into what kind of life it was living, we first need to take a look at where it was living. Deinonychus has been found namely in the Cloverly and Antlers formations, which were deposited around most of the Midwest of North America in the middle of the Cretaceous, between 115 and 108 million years ago. Throughout this environment at the time were a mixture of more open floodplains with braided rivers, denser subtropical forests, and many swamps, with this paleo environment being heavily comparable to the natural areas of Louisiana. Living here, you had small generalist mammals, some freshwater fish and reptiles, and a wide range of dinosaurs, including Aquilops, Sauropelta, Astrodon, the massive Sauroposeidon, the infamous Aquacanthosaurus, which I talk more about here, Microvenator, and an ornithopod named Tenontosaurus. Now this last dinosaur in particular has been one of interest when it comes to Deinonychus. Various sites of Tenontosaurus living in groups have been found in association with Deinonychus teeth, not only that, but one site even has several Deinonychus skeletons near groups of Tenontosaurus with four adults and one juvenile specimen. Now, it's a common misconception that we know for a fact that Dromaeosaurs hunted in packs, because we really don't. And even when we find evidence for one species, that doesn't mean they all did. Lions and tigers are within the same genus, but they live very different lifestyles when it comes to socialising. Now the fact that several adults and a juvenile were found so close to a group of Tenontosauruses does seem to heavily suggest that Deinonychus was indeed a pack hunter. Along with this, Tenontosaurus is not exactly a small animal, being roughly 6 metres or 19.5 feet long, and anywhere between 1 and 4 tonnes. 
With this much evidence for Dononicus preying upon them, it actually seems unlikely that Dononicus didn't work together to some degree, because a solitary one would most certainly not have taken down a fully grown Tenontosaurus. One Tenontosaurus bone even had some tooth bite marks, so these had some pretty hefty jaws as well. Now the debates being had have been more about how actually cooperative these group efforts were. Some have argued that it was similar to Komodo dragons, who come together to take down large prey items, but do not live together and get very violent with each other when it comes to who gets the meat. Some of these sites have been found with sub-adults that show potential signs of being attacked and killed by other larger Dononicuses, meaning they didn't really get along the same way pack animals do. But at the same time, trackways have also been found in association with Dononicus that appear to show more coordinated attack patterns, which you can't come up with if you don't get along and don't live together. Then, once it got hold, those famous toe claws would be used to pin down and slash or hold on to the prey, whilst the jaws did the killing. Now, I've just glazed over a lot of research done on Dononicus, but I've barely scratched the surface. The most famous paleontologist to have worked on Dononicus was a guy named John Ostrom. John Ostrom was a theropod expert and is cited by some as being solely responsible for what has been termed the dinosaur renaissance during the 1960s. Before this, the general perception of dinosaurs was very reptilian, being slow, lumbering, cold-blooded giant lizards with relatively inactive lifestyles. This is reflected a lot when we look at old movies featuring dinosaurs. Of course, now we know better, and it's pretty much thanks to this guy. Ostrom saw in these theropods what few before him had. He saw the pelvis was remarkably similar in its positioning to birds, around the time when dinosaurs' tails were being lifted from the ground, and he also saw how similar the feet and hands were, noting similarities with Archaeopteryx, which, for some reason, everyone just kind of forgot about with regards to its relation to birds and other dinosaurs. With all of Ostrom's work with Dononicus through the 60s, the bird descendant hypothesis was revived, and the world now saw a dinosaur that was clearly a very active, agile, and warm-blooded predator that looked and moved very much like a ground bird. This began the massive shift for the entire group of Dinosauria, with even the general public catching on pretty quick that these weren't cold-blooded, slow and redundant lizards, but the entire group were more active, flamboyant and exciting animals, all thanks to a little theropod named Dinonychus anteropus, who helped dinosaurs become just a little bit less misunderstood. Catch you guys next time.